Okay, let's let everybody in. Okay, just give that a minute. People filing in. Oh, so, so many, that's unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, we've got a great, great turnout. That's wonderful. Okay, um, so let's kick off. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Shannon Ganem, and I'm the Global Education Director at Magnum Photos. Um, thank you for joining us for this special event to share some more information about our one-year course in Paris the creative documentary and photojournalism program that we offer in collaboration with our partner Speos. Um, today we'll meet some of the Magnum and Speos team and one of this year's mentors on the program, Magnum photographer, Nana Heitman. Um, this session aims to give you an overview of the program, share some inspiration from Nana and answer as many questions as we can in the hour. Um, if we don't manage to answer everything, we will provide details on how you can contact us with any specific questions, and I will pop those in the chat, um, and we'll also have them on the screen at the end of the presentation. Um, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome our team and our special guests today. Uh, big welcome to Sonia Junet, who manages educational programming at Magnum Photos and is the course leader on this program from the Magnum side. Hey, Sonia, how are you doing? Thank you. Hello. And introducing Nana Heitman. Um, Nana is a German-Russian documentary photographer currently based in Moscow, Russia. Her work often deals with issues of isolation, physical, social, and spiritual, as well as the very nature of how people react and interact uh, with their environment. She has received awards that include the Leica Oscar Barnack Newcomer Award, the Olivier Ribot, uh, Ribo Award and the Ian Parry Award of Achievement and has been listed on the 30 new and emerging photographers to watch in, in 2020. Uh, Nana's work has been published widely, um, including many fantastic publications, National Geographic, Time Magazine, uh, Stern Magazine. She has worked on assignments for outlets, including the New York Times, Time Magazine, the Washington Post and Stern Magazine. Uh, Nana joined Magnum as a nominee in 2019. And lastly, a very warm welcome. Hi, sorry, hi, hey Nana, how are you? Hey, you really Thanks. read all my biography. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. We can't wait to have a look at some of your work. Um, and lastly, a very warm welcome to uh, Theo Bellock, who is Beos executive assistant who will be walking us through the program in more detail and helping us answer all of your questions. So thank you for your time today, Theo, how are you? Hi, I'm good. <laughs> good, welcome, welcome. Um, so the format for our session today, uh, we have 20 minutes, maybe a little longer because I've kind of gone through that intro pretty quickly. Uh, 25 minutes to see the work of Nana, followed by a Q&A uh, with us and, and with you. So if you have any questions uh, for Nana, if you would like to put those into the Q&A box um, and we will try and answer as many of those as we can, please note we're not using the raised hand function, so just the Q&A. Um, and then after that, we'll have a presentation uh, by Theo and we'll be discussing uh, the course in more detail. And then we'll answer all of your questions at the end um, and wrap up in, yeah, about an hour. So thank you everyone uh, for joining. And with that, I'll hand over to Nana, if you would like to share. Yeah, I, I start the process. Thank you. <laughs> so one second. Um, So now you just see one part, no? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So hey, um, I'm really glad to be here that 
you both invited me here. And because we have a bit limited time, I'm only going to share like one project, a more free one. Oops. So because like usually I work a lot of um, assignments that are more journalistic nature, like current topics. And so from time to time, I kind of like to escape from this and work like more in long term projects that are more from my soul where I can be more creative because I think like on assignments, you kind of start repeating yourself and just try out new things. And yeah, so one is, of them is hiding from Baba Yaga. So I'm going to start with this map to show you where I'm taking you. It's in a river in Siberia, the Yenisei River, which flows almost 4,000 kilometer here from almost the Mongolian border north right for all Siberia into the Arctic Ocean. And the project, it's not completed at all yet because last year I wanted to go back and then of course the pandemic hit, so I didn't want to travel to such a remote region. So the green one is like, it looks really small, but was like, I think 17,000 kilometers of a journey by car and all the other part, it's just accessible by a mail boat, which carries like all products or mails and so on to the remote settlements in the northern region. So yeah, for me, the story was not necessarily about the river, but it's more like I chose the river as a red line because I was interested in the area to kind of follow and explore like this remote region. And this all kind of started when I was studying in Tomsk. You see it really small here as an exchange semester. Yeah, and from there I kind of took a car and traveled to the Yenisei River for several times. So a little bit to the history of the Yenisei River and like about my inspiration. So like I've seen like the Yenisei like historically as a place of freedom and of escape. So like the Russians, they only came in 1607, chased by the greed for this valuable fur, they always expanded deeper and deeper into the taiga, which was completely unexplored at this time. So those were like Cossack rider associations that were like groups that formed out of criminals, escaped serfs, upper states, or simply adventurers who joined together in these rider associations and settled then 1607 on the Yenisei River for, for the first time. So in this, like the life on the, of the settlers for this time, it was like really free and self-determined. Like there were no serfs, no kind of slaves, which was typical for Tsarist Russia at this time. And also the old believers settled also on the lonely, on the most remote banks of the Yenisei River to escape the persecution of the Tsar and later from the Soviets, because they didn't accept the reforms of the Orthodox Church that were made then. And with Stalin, like all this kind of changed because like the Soviets, they really invested in the developing of like or urbanizing Siberia and the Arctic. So like they built like this huge dams, like here's a picture where it's like the lake which developed from the dam and the climate change and whole villages were swept over. And like with Soviet Union kind of this changed again so like from the like the infrastructure which the soviets built up completely collapsed so there was isolation unemployment school closing lack of medical care which you still feel today like there's some parts or many parts of the Yenisei river they kind of live in, com live in complete anarchy oh are you seeing oh wait i think you're seeing my yeah, we can see your house. The video. Ah, okay. So, but you don't see the videos, no? No, okay, good. Um, so a little bit to the inspiration why I even went on this journey. So um, like my mother is Russian and my grandmother. So I grew up hearing the Russian fairy tales from them when I was growing up and like a really popular recurring character in these stories was Baba Yaga. She's like this grumpy, dangerous, evil witch with an appetite for children. And she lives like in this little hut on hands like in the middle of the forest. So in one story, the witch takes a girl known as Vasilisa the Beautiful as her prisoner. And like, because she's so gentle to all her surroundings, with the help of a black cat, she managed to escape by throwing a comb and a 
towel behind her, like a broad river and a thick forest kind of emerges and so so thick that Baba Yaga can't get through anymore. And so the river and the forest is kind of saving her from her. So these are like, for example, illustrations by Bilibin, who illustrated all those Slavic fairy tales. I found them generally like really inspiring for just by the motives for the project. Yeah, and still like because I like the story was still or this journey was like more like a, still like a road trip so I always asked myself what holds the story together and what does it stand for and the longer I traveled the more I learned kind of about the situation of the people or the peop more people I encountered the more this feeling of like different layers of isolations I had like this physical isolation social or spiritual as well as their very nature, how people react and interact with the other, with each other or their environment. So I would like to introduce you to Yuri. He lives on a landfill and like everything you see on the pictures, what he collected by the stuff you can, he found on the landfill. So he kind of built like his little paradise or escape from the city there. And like I asked him once how he ended up there and he said like all his friends, they are on the, they live, he said on the cemetery because of drugs or alcohol. So yeah, because like since collapse of Soviet Union, especially in Tuvan Republic, like the synthetic drugs and alcohol, it became like a really big problem together with resulting from unemployment. So he says like only at this place, he can feed like his 15 street dogs, which even if he has like a flat in the city, he couldn't of course live there with all those dogs. That's inside Yuri's hut. And of course, like the summer fires are always a topic when traveling in Siberia. Oh, we meet a former ballerina, um, Sofia. She works now in a striptease club since she injured her uncle and kind of dreams now to start a new career in a theater. We meet Vasilisa, she's the daughter of two deaf parents in a village of, or they, they are the only non-believers in a village of old believers, which they have like this strict rules, how, when they have to pray, how they have to pray, they are not allowed to have TV or products with QR codes, not to own any like Western or worldly world things like a passport or receive pension. So they live kind of also isolated in this already isolated community. And what also inspired me on the on this work were like the concept and motives and aesthetics of the old Russian painters. Like there's Ivan Shishkin from the 19th or late 19th century, which I always used to look at when I came to Moscow because my grandmother used to work there in one of the main galleries, the Tretikovsky Gallery. So there's, for example, Shishkin, who is using this really light color palette in kind of revealing the beauty of the resilient Russian, rural, rural Russian folk culture. culture. And there's Ivan Nesterov, who kind of one of his main topics in his work was also portraying the old believers who lived then on the Volga River. And maybe you noticed I really love to take portraits because I, I don't know, once I discovered that I really love the energy or the tension that develops between me and the portrait person. So, yeah, usually when I get like the approval to photograph the people, like mostly I still kind of like I try to meet the people or sometimes get really to know them for a long time. But when I photograph, I mostly kind of keep up a conversation going as I set up the camera and find the right position. And then while the process of photographing, I think I get quite still because I'm just too con concentrated. So 
I asked the person to kind of stand still like they might have in the 19th century, not moving. And once I start photographing, I mostly, I'm yeah, I'm so focused on the frame and trying to read the person and study their face and their emotion. And then I think you just need kind of to trust that something in this exchange between them and me will carry on the photograph, some kind of magic on the moment. So it's like for me, while photographing, I think it's important to always hold on to the attention of the subject to keep something going between us. Like for me, it's not chatting, but something, I don't know, something that keeps me contact, connected with whoever they are so I can keep kind of reading or studying them. So like, as I said already, I was trying like to kind of chase this feeling of isolation and then the more or less by chance I met more and more people that are connected in some ways to isolation like for example I met Valentin in a library he's a former veteran who or officer who served in Afghanistan and now lives in the forests even in Siberia even in the winter and as kind of like a priest preaching that people should live in peace together marching to the far through the forest to protect from um, clear cutting or from fires in the summer. Because I think there I was talking also before or when I started this project with a former mentor. mentor. So I think this was really helpful for me to, to not get lost completely because like I was still like sometimes in contact with Mats Nesny and he also said like a uh, road trip or a journey along the river it can be like different of different different like visuals or emotions coming like to you and you just can get easily completely lost and that you always have to hunt one feeling that kind of transport the river for you because you can't really tell like an all connected story with like a road trip. So that was like what I asked myself then day and night, like what is this feeling? And yeah, the more I traveled, the more it kind of developed. Here's again the Sayana Shushins gets the ninth largest dam in the world, which the Soviets built to supply a nickel factory more up north with energy. And since the collapse of Soviet Union, like also in the remote regions, there's also a huge rise of like patriotism, but also nationalism. And in Tuvan Republic, for example, there is now like plenty, plenty of shaman clinics that are like shaman hospitals kind of where um, once they like before they were persecuted in in the Soviet Union and not allowed to practice so now people like first would go to the shaman before like consulting with a doctor for example Nana you might have said but how long did this body of work take? Um, I think like I traveled like maybe like three months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I went once back in the winter. Yeah, but that's not in the collection here. <laughs> and you're you're shooting film? I shoot like actually there. It's kind of mixed. Like I shoot for the first time with a large format camera. I got from someone in Tom's, but I didn't have a possibility to develop the film there. So I like he kind of the person in Tomsk he showed me how to use it, but I never knew if like I do everything right. So I just in case I always shoot digital at the same time, but I think the large format kind of even helped me for the digital pictures. Like sometimes the digital were better, some because I did some mistakes sometimes with the large format, sometimes the large format were better. But I think just the way of working and being like really slow and also that people when you come with like this huge camera understand like this is a process where it's not just clicking like you need some patience and maybe also kind of corporate mm -hmm. together it was like really helpful mm -hmm. uh, portraits 
because I was really struck by what you said about that idea of trying to have that feeling in mind and I was thinking if you're shooting film like we all used to at one point how do you know what the images look like how do you know how that feeling is translating easy to understand it when you're when you can see the pictures yeah so. yeah no I don't in at least in large format I don't trust myself always enough to just shoot a large but sometimes I'm just too lazy to to carry it <laughs> Yeah, but in the end, I was myself surprised that it kind of even worked to to mix the pictures. Here is uh, ballerina Laura in a ballet school where Sofia also formerly was trained. Is it okay if I ask some questions from the people as you? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. We, we can still go answer them. Yeah, that's, but... that's much better than just me talking. <laughs> Few people have asked, um, um, how do you get in touch with the people you photograph and uh, how you convince people in taking images of them? Do you, how do you go about explaining your work? And um, yeah, how do you, in general, no, this is, it's coming back. It's a recurring question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think at this point it was kind of like I was this student who came from Germany to study in Tomsk and to make this project. So I just like explained that I'm like a student working on this story about the Yenisei River. So most people were like really open. And I think just in Russia, sometimes it's like, often it's like you ask, like you're really struck by one person and getting to know them. And then maybe after some time you dare to ask to take a portrait and then it's like this shyness, or I think like even maybe the person is even interested to photograph, but they just feel too shy or don't understand why I'm interested in them. So they are like pointing to their neighbor, why you don't photograph him. So I think sometimes I just try to kind of explain like what I see, what, what fascinates me about the person that I'm not looking for a fashion model, but yeah, just what I kind of try to explain what I saw in this moment, why I want to photograph them. And sometimes it work, sometimes not. Yeah, so it always depends. <laughs> with people like Valentin here, he really likes to be photographed. So it was easy with Yuri on the landfill. He first wouldn't let me photograph and just like he was proud on what he built up there so I could photograph this, but him, he himself was like really shy. And I think he just saw how sad I was because I was trying so long to find a road to this place. And yeah, so in the end it worked. And I think like more and more with the time I try much more to spend time with, like on a pro project I worked recently, I sometimes would spend first like three, four days just spending time with the people and getting to know they're not even mentioning anything about photographs. Like I think this becomes became like more and more important for me. Mm, that's really important. Yeah. Being like kind of the people as objects. And Nana, you're having those conversations in Russian. A lot of people asking if you speak Russian. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I speak Russian. Like like I didn't speak I refused to speak for a long time, but my mom fortunately always spoke to me so yeah I have now a funny accent but I understand everything and can speak so if, I don't know for me that's always really important I think I would like to work in other countries but if I don't speak the language I don't I don't understand how it could be working like of course like an English speaking country yes but if it's like just like, I don't know, going to India or whatever and not having the chance to really speak to the people. It's like, for me, maybe like watching a theater and just interpreting things yourself. Mm. Um, few people are asking, and I wanted to ask you the same, is when you started the project, did you, did you have an itinerary or was the things that you're the route you followed was more like serendipity and the people you encountered as well. I didn't understand. But did I have what? Was it was it like the road that you followed and the places you visited? Did you plan them in advance or it kind of like happen as you were traveling? Mm, I think like the road was like clear because it was like the roads I could take along the river, like the I like went the fastest I could go. 
or the most place I like the old believers were like kind of the beginning of the river, like not the official beginning, because like the official beginning is somewhere in the mountains where you just can get by helicopter. But I went like kind of to the first settlements. And I think not the road was what I planned, but more like that I tried to be there. For example, there was this horse, it was like a horse race in Tuvan Republic which is like the main national holiday there. So I kind of tried to be there at this time. And yeah, maybe more like this, but also a lot of things were like coincidence. Yeah, but of course I tried to look up some places I would like to stop also when going now north. And because you need, especially for the north, you need approvals from the FSB to travel there because it's like military restricted area. So you kind of need to plan where you want to stop. Yeah. And Nana, a lot of people asking if you traveled by yourself. Um, I traveled like part by my, like the first part, the first weeks I traveled by myself. And then later I traveled with my, with my partner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but traveling by yourself, I find more effective. Like I think most pictures I took when I'm myself because you kind of at least it would not always works, but I don't know, when I managed to get into this working tunnel, I think you kind of see the world really different and are, I don't know, look really different at things. So if you're not alone, I think it's more difficult to get in through this um, state of mind, like with euphoria and everything. And so I'm just looking at, at the time and I'm, yeah. I'm I have a few questions around, um, yeah. I'm sure that people are watching who will end up taking the course and, and having that year to kind of work on a personal project. And maybe we can talk a little bit about how we would suggest people use that time or how you think that, you know, your, as you were saying, your men previous kind of relationships with mentors or, and Sonia, maybe you have a specific question around that. Yeah, I think for me, they were like, Two things really regarding to the course. So for everyone on the on, on the call now, Nana will be one of the mentor uh, next year for the Magnum Spears course in Paris. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you, Nana, is like, what advice now would you give to someone that is about to embark on this one year photography course in Paris? And if you can also maybe you touched that upon that already, but the role of a mentor now in developing a mm -hmm. project yeah yeah like i don't know i just i can talk from my experience also studying myself i'm actually i'm still enrolled for years already and didn't just didn't do my bachelor <laughs> so maybe i'm even in the same boat kind of but um yeah what was for me important or like first when i studied we had like this um older professor who was like really classic reportage. And this was like super nice for me in the beginning and he kind of could keep us together, but yeah, he, it was like just photojournalism and not really letting anything else in there and not letting try people more personal things, for example. So when he retired, we had some guest lectures kind of, and for example, we had like I mentioned before, Mats Nissen and Dominic Blar, and we only, they only came like three times for like some block courses to our school but for me they were like kind of enlightening because they were really open for different the most different visual languages and like discussing them also like going much more deeper much more personal like I remember a lot of people were crying because it was like also a bit like psychotherapy and um but up uh, yeah, I think for me, even I just still kind of missed that there was, they were not always there, like they came three times. So yeah, and I still bothered them sometimes by mail. But so this, for me, it was, was like more, most important to have someone you can continuously talk to, because at least myself, I kind of always dubbed what I'm doing. And yeah, I think Sonia, you also, we talked once before about that um, like at least in my school there we had like a lot of courses like portrait photography this photography so I think we were all like kind of overwhelmed to do everything like in a good quality so 
I just remember at one point, I just kind of decided to put all my energy in that one course and that one developing like one project and then kind of be like a good student in this one and be a bad student in the other courses and put like all my energy with the, in this course. And yeah, and just being like in this collect, I think that was the most beautiful for me about studying that you're in in a group with people who share like the same passion and you have like this kind of luxury to spend like all your time on photography and with the people who kind of share the same interests that was I think like the greatest thing and also not just with the teacher but added also with your um student mates together and yeah um, I have, we have a question and it's kind of my question as well. Yeah. The course with Speos is, you know, we, we think it's very special because you have the best of Speos, you have the best of Magnum. And someone is asking here what your experience of Magnum has been like and, you know, working with the staff, working with the photographers, what, what can people expect? Um, what, oh, how it's with other Magnum yeah how how have what's your kind of uh, time with magnum been like for me it was like of course like super unexpected but it's like of course a really big passion also like i don't know with without magnum i would have never or didn't know how to meet i don't know i think just the people from the stuff they also give me all like a really good insight how kind of the market works more also on the gallery side I would have never known with my myself which prices I should set up for my art prints fine art prints for example or also by just seeing how all the other photographers work it gave me like a completely different insight like the importance of photo books and yeah I think mostly before in my school it was really like this classic like you have one story and your biggest goal is to publish it in a newspaper and I think that's the market is just not there anymore to publish everyone's work even if it's like a great work it's hard to find a place so I think that's really helpful for me to look how all the other guys from Magnum are doing this with different layers of working photo books exhibition and of course everyone brainstorming because I think everyone has like kind of oops the same questions or like how the yeah. and that is one of one of the other questions around how, how you're financing and funding your projects and it's hard isn't it in photography and so that's what we love our job which is helping people kind of navigate yeah. to make it work to do the things that they want to do you know the things that they care about yeah that was what actually from the um, mentorship which really helped me because sometimes they come as photographers and they give some talks and how they went there to Iraq and with their fixer and then you wonder who's like a fixer and and wonder how like how they even like how does everything work how they finance and that was like really helpful to see like any like a person who actually works in the photo world and it's not a professor who worked like 30 years ago in the photo world was really important for me like how important it is to write grants to apply for grants competitions even if you don't win like that it's a good chance especially for shy people like me to to show your work to like professional people I know I know we've run over time but that is one maybe one last question because I know everyone will be asking you've had a really great run of being nominated for different awards so congratulations and any tips top tips <laughs> <laughs> how does it work um I think just 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 apply like because like before I thought like this work it's not good enough to apply and then yeah especially with Dominic he was like opening the page with like which grants are ending today which prices and he's like why are you still sitting here like you should apply now and from then on like I really I spent so much time like on applying with my finished projects and even at first it was like some at some small festivals or some small prices no one knows but it still kind of gives you at least some motivation to go and yeah and still like some people see your work and even if you pay like sometimes it's you have to pay something to apply I think still it kind of pay pays back in the end Thank you, Nana. Thank you.
<laughs> well, I wish that we could ask you lots more questions, but maybe there, were, there will be other opportunities. We're doing many more kind of online events um, at Magnum these days. So we'd love to have another conversation, more in-depth conversation with you. That yeah. was great. We'll be happy. Thank Beautiful. you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. So I, I leave the window. Yeah, we can let you go. Thank okay. you so much. <laughs> for inviting and for everyone listening. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye, Nana. OK, great. Super oh, inspiring. Yes. Her, the way she talks about how she does portraits is incredible, no? Mm, really good. Yeah. Beautiful. OK, thank you. Over to you, um, Theo. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, so today I'm going to speak uh, more in general about SPEOS, but also in particular um, with the Magnum Photographic course. But first I'm going to show you a little video of um, so that you have a proper taste of what it's like to be uh, at the school and studying with the Magnum Photographic course. So just one second, I'm going to show my screen. Thank you, Theo. And this is really giving us a good look at the facilities that you guys have there, beautiful facilities. Great to see. Okay. Just gonna remove this. And Okay, so I enjoy you. I hope you enjoy the video and um, which gives you a proper overview of the premises at Spears. I'm just going to share my screen again and show you my slides. Uh, just one second. Okay. 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 Yeah. 
perfect. Um, so just to tell you that uh, SPEOS is one of the top five best photo school in the world. And we do have an average of 180 students uh, every year with more than 30 different nationalities and a network of more than 4,000 alumni uh, over 50 countries. Uh, we do have two campuses, one in Paris and one in London, and also students in the long uh, term program can choose to share their studies between the two uh, campuses. Um, I think which is really important to uh, say about the training in SPEOS is that we are really focusing, you have been able to see that on the video, but we are really focusing on uh, hands-on practice, so you're working um, and learning with professional photographers, uh, working and taking pictures alongside them, and also, um, so that's uh, the approach of uh, the photography that we do at Spios and in the Magnum premises as well, um, working in small groups um, in order to for you to have the best follow-up and also provide students with um, all the facilities and equipment that they need in order to improve their techniques in um, photography. Regarding the creative documentary and photojournalism by Magnum Photos and Spears, uh, we already say that, but I would like to add that uh, it's available in one year in English in Paris. And it is made for people who, are, who wants to uh, have a proper career in documentary photography or in photojournalism. Um, so how it's made, uh, actually, um, so during the week, you will have one day a week taking pictures in the Magnum premises with the Magnum uh, photographers. And the rest of the, the week, you will have um, classes on ground on campus at the spheres premises and working on your um, the essential of the techniques of photography. So the program goes from September to July and you will have a first part, uh, which is the first semester um, from September to December, or you will learn all the basics or the essentials of uh, the photography techniques. Um, so you're gonna take pictures outside using natural lights, and you will be guided by uh, your teacher, which are also professional photographer on the side, and um, they're gonna help you um, mastering those techniques. Once you get that, um, we'll go from the second semester, uh, from January to May, and you will have, um, so you will work on long-term projects, uh, and more fo in focusing more on the storytelling and the photojournalism, the creative documentary side. And uh, at the end of the program, uh, from June to July, we, which we will also um, train you uh, as was in uh, Nanine uh, experience at Magnum uh, with the pho Magnum photography course um, in the business side of photography. So um, you will have a lot of lectures with professional photographers, uh, which are gonna come and explain to you what is the reality of the work, uh, the professional photographer work uh, right now, and also give you advice on how to start well, how to uh, build your own portfolio as a professional photographer, and also um, explain to you how to make a business plan and how to uh, insert yourself in the photographic market. Okay, um, just to give you some ideas of um, what the classes are like, uh, we do have a lot of different classes, uh, essential of photography, photojournalism, um, the classes with Magnum photos, obviously, um, and you will learn as well as the basic techniques uh, of photography, but also uh, all the post-production skills. That means that uh, how to be able to use um, the Lightroom and Photoshop software, but also 
how to uh, manage an image stock or uh, how to obtain high quality prints uh, for your exhibition in the future. Um, and also give you proper advice on the storytelling and uh, basic techniques of the, the video as well for photographers. Um, okay. and at the end of the program, um, if, you are, if you have validated all your uh, credits, uh, you will receive um, an accreditation from Speos and Magnum, uh, which is a certification um, so combined with the two um, school and agency. And also the title of photographer and CPL level seven, which is um, actually um, the equivalent of a master degree in photography. So that's the highest degree you can receive in photography uh, today. So yeah, if you have any um, more questions that uh, we are not able to um, answer today, uh, you can just uh, contact us and book a visit online um, on the SPARES website and I will show you all the different premises and explain to you how our teachers are working with our students and also um, uh, answer all questions that you may have about the program in itself. And if you want to apply, uh, it's really easy. You gonna have to go on the SPARES website and um, fulfill your details, your contact info and uh, with, with the program that you are interested in and uh, fulfill also a resume, a motivation letter and uh, 10 to 15 photos that you've been taken and that you find the, uh, the best at the moment you do the application. Okay, just some days to remember the program is beginning, is beginning in the 15th of September as uh, this year, and it's going to end uh, on uh, July 29th uh, next year. The days of uh, the exhibition may change, but for the moment we are on the 18th and the 19th of May 2022. Okay, so if you have any questions, I'm going to... Brilliant. Thank you, Theo. Maybe, maybe before we get into the questions, maybe Sonia and I can just recap a little bit from our side the things that we, the things that we feel, uh, you know, the value that the that the Magnum team, that the Magnum photographers are adding to the to the course. I've got a list, Sonia. Or Sonia, do you want to dive in? I can. I can start if you want. Yeah, just, that would be great. Um, just to so I think um, I'm going to try to. Um, so the, the, it's a it's a partnership between Spales and Magnum, and we I think both Spales and Magnum bring two very different things to the course. Um, Magnum, so as Theo said, you are in the in the office one day a week, and you it's not to take pictures, but it's always with a Magnum photographer. Uh, and what we want you to develop in this one year and one day a week over one year is your um, we want to help you think photographically and especially we want to help you develop one body of work. So very early on in the course, you're going to have a talk with your mentor about what is going to be your personal project for the year. And this is going to be like for us kind of the thread throughout the year of what each of you individually are going to work on. Um, and because it's your personal project, it's something that you're going to work on your personal time. Um, and, and what Spills brings, it's basically all the much more professional Spills is making you basically ready to um, work for magazines and corporate clients. And so you're going to develop a more like commercial and corporate and editorial uh, portfolio with bills because we have you have access to the studios you're going to have like uh, classes about lightning and all of that and this doesn't happen with magnum no we really want to talk about uh, documentary photography and storytelling in the magnum site and, and, and so this is what we focus on more at magnum uh, and while i think of it 
the, the exhibition that Theo talked about, it's actually taking place at the Magnum Gallery and it's more than two days. I think it's one week, but maybe. Um, so just so the, the end of the the end of the year in June 2022, there will be a show at the Magnum Gallery um, of the work that you will have been working on throughout this year. So this personal project that you're going to be developing with the Magnum photographers. Great. And yeah, I think I was just thinking about um, when we were preparing for the for this open day, I, I really like some of the language um, that I saw on the Speos website, which is, you know, this idea of being kind of embedded um, at Magnum. And it is, it's, it's a very unique program, you know, giving you that opportunity to do that, meeting all of the team of the Magnum Paris staff, um, who are fantastic experts in there, you know, all of the different aspects of a photographic running of a photographic agency. Um, as we were talking about in the education team, we are very proud of this idea of, you know, demystifying the industry, helping you, you to navigate all of the aspects, all of the ways that we're working in the agency, we like to share with our community um, so that you can do your best work and your most important work. Um, what else would I say? The mentoring with the Magnum photographer, that's incredibly, incredibly valuable. Um, as, as Nana was saying, that idea of having that kind of consistent support. You've got the support of the Magnum Learn team um, and also our network of, of industry, industry, you know, leaders, whether it's a curator, it's a picture editor. Um, we love to connect you with, with the people that we're working with. Um, I know that the Magnum Paris team are very proud of the library that they have, library of photo books, which you have access to. Um, and yeah, the exhibition at the end. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe just to add, so the, the mentors this year are going to be Nana, who you just met. They will be Patrick Zachman, who has been actually one of the mentors on the course for many years now, and probably Olivia Arthur, uh, and each of you will be assigned to one of these mentors and they will be uh, seeing you in person every three to four months and you'll have um, a Zoom meeting with them monthly so they can follow your, the evolution of your project. And then every week there is a new Magnum photographer that comes. Um, and this is really amazing because basically we kind of like what happens on that day with them really depends on who comes. So. Peter Van Hackman is going to do a lot of editing exercises where he brings, he prints a lot of small prints and make you think of what the art of editing. Um, and but then you can also have Alex Sos if he's in Paris or Susan Mesla. So the, it's it's not like because Paris is a hub for the photographers, they sometimes come from the US or other parts of the world, and we also take this opportunity to organize a day with them for you. Um, most often it's not going to be shooting day at Magnum, but sometimes it can happen as well, no? That someone, one of the photographer will give you like a two hours assignment where you go and shoot and then come back and we look at work, which is also really fun. Um, and so, yeah, this is for like the curriculum, really. Great. Just conscious of time. And I know that there's a lot of kind of nuts and bolts things that people are asking and that we can give more information on. Price, clearly, 30,000 euros for the year. Um, people are asking if there is any kind of scholarship program, funding. Not this year. We are always talking about how we can, um, how we can support, better support. So that's something that we're thinking about. We do offer scholarships for some of the other Magnum programs and I will put a link in the chat for that. Um, you know, maybe can you talk about payment in how the payment process works and the payment in installments? Uh, yeah, of course, actually for um, scholarships, you can also ask um, Campus France um, so in order to see what kind of scholarship you may be eligible for in your country. Uh, and in terms of payments, um, actually during the ad application process, um, once we receive your application, we study it and we give you 
and then so after two weeks. And uh, after that, you will be asked to uh, make a first deposit of 3,500 euros. And once it's made, um, your place is secure in the program. And after that, you can choose to pay in several installments, up to six, but we can also uh, arrange some uh, business installments uh, later on if you need to. That's great to know. Um, there's a question about um, COVID and the impact on the course for next year, if you can talk about this as well. Uh, actually, um, as I was saying, and um, we do keep the groups really small, it doesn't affect us uh, a lot this year. Um, we are still open, people and students keep going to class. Uh, they just wear a mask and keep social distancing, but we have a lot of spacious facilities, so it doesn't really bother us. And uh, I hope that uh, in the, in, for the intake in September, um, we will be uh, get rid of <laughs> this finally, uh, as uh, in France, we are going to reopen the shops and restaurants uh, in the near future. Um, yeah, I hope it will be all back to normal um, for the next intake in, in September. Thank you. Absolutely. And in the end, with our last uh, year, we ended up delivering, like much of the Magnum educational programming, we delivered everything on Zoom. So we always kind of have a plan B, but we're definitely hoping that we'll see everybody in person and planning for that. Um, a lot of people asking age limit, and which is a good question around criteria and who this is kind of aimed at different levels. I would say, or Theo, do you want to take that one? I would say there is none. <laughs> um, actually, our youngest students uh, last year was 18, and uh, the oldest was around uh, 60. So um, it's really a lot of different cultures, people from different nationalities, but also different ages um, at the uh, at the Spheres mm -hmm. program. I think yeah. in terms of like requirement and what it, is this course good for you or the right for you, we've seen in the previous years the participants come from all walks of life. Some of them have been working in photography and really won't decide that this is the time they're going to make this. They're going to make the step seriously to become fully professional. Um, some are taking have like businesses. There was a chemist last year and she just decided that she was going to have a career change. Um, and, and I think for me, the most important is like, are you really ready to work hard for a year and dedicate this time in Paris um, to work on photography only? And, and I think this is like, it's such an amazing, if you commit to it, you can get a lot out of it if you're ready to work hard. I actually wanted Nana to say this, but she hasn't, so I'm saying it. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, it's in an investment in your career, whether that's the beginning of your career, whether it's, you know, mid-career and you're, you're, you know, doubling back and thinking about how else you want to, what you want to do something else, you want to do your photography differently. So, yes, it's absolutely, we love it when people are, you know, giving it 100%. And one of the questions that we had was, you know, what is the kind of aftercare after the program? Um, and it is that is very much, you know, you are part of that is about you creating your own network with your peers, but then you're meeting Magnum photographers, Magnum staff, Speo staff, uh, industry people, and what you do with that network is really down to you. Um, and we love, you know, we love staying in touch with people. Sonia and I are still kind of in WhatsApp groups from different workshops of we love seeing people can you know supporting each other and that we're able to kind of jump in and and give advice as well so hopefully it's just the beginning of beginning of something what else do we need to cover um how many hours per week it's full time but still maybe you can explain a bit more yeah of course um actually we will have uh, 20 to 25 hours of class each week um, and also uh, so on ground on campus. And I will say 10 hours of 
personal work as well. Um, it can be about um, the composition, what you're going to bring into your pictures, what which story um, you're going to tell throughout your pictures, um, but also in the post-production work. So we, you're going to have a proper method um, on how to work with the software at Spios, but afterwards, uh, if you want to edit your pictures, it's always a process which takes a bit of time. So yeah, in global, I would say it's 30 to 35 hours a week of, of work uh, for, the, for this program. In total. Thank you. That's, yeah, it is full time. Completely. Any final thoughts? Otherwise, we might have to wrap it. And as I said, if you know, if we haven't answered your question, if you're interested, please reach out to us, and we'd love to have a conversation and tell you exactly how it works, how it might work for you. And I, I think we should say that there will be an upcoming online event in the coming months or two, where we're going to showcase work from um, students from the. 2019-2020 course who we have kept in touch with and uh, we'll have an exhibition in Paris in Magnum in, in October hopefully maybe you want to talk about it yeah we're still just finalizing the date but hopefully looking like the first weekend of October um, with events around that and yes the idea we've you know we have absolutely as kind of tough as this year has been for everyone, we're loving the opportunity that Zoom offers. So everyone, the, the group is around the world and we're able to kind of connect the group with our community, whether that's you know people like you, so you can be inspired by their work and see how they're kind of figuring out you know, their journey or whether that's our network of you know, industry people. So that's just something new that we've kind of added in that opportunity to showcase the work online. Hope to do that too. Okay, all right, well, that was great. Thank you very much, guys. And hope, as I said, yeah, if we haven't answered your question, I do apologize and, and do reach out. Um, and lots more information on the SPEOS. Obviously that this is not the only program that SPEOS do, the wonderful kind of full program. Same with us, lots of Lots of fantastic things happening. We have our seminar series, online seminar series launching next week. Hope to see some of you there as well. And I've put the free opportunities into the chat um, that we offer as well. Great. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Theo. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank Take you. care. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for your questions.